everyone here for the final program in the five series that we've had. Um, how many of you have been here for all of these coverage? Anybody? Look at this. Oh, aside from you. <laughs> okay, excellent. How many have been here for four? All right, now we're getting to the part four. Okay, very good. Uh, we'll, we promise to have another program or two next year, but according to the plan, uh, the, the um, next year the water study group will be pulling all of this material together, and in the next year, year and a half, they will produce a report that we made public on the state of affairs with regard to water in Thurston County. So let me ask all of those people who have been involved in the water study to please stand. There's a whole bunch of people. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Big round of applause for this. Okay. A lot of hard work has gone on and will go on uh, for the next bit of time. Very important study, and we are very grateful for their hard work and for the rest of us in the league who support them and try to keep the trains running on time. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, thank you to our videographer. Yeah, uh, we're happy to have you here tonight. <laughs> we'll be live. Uh, you can see us at lwbthurston.org when it's posted. And if, for, per chance, you missed another of the programs, uh, as I had to do because I was ill, you can go there and look at the reports, and you'll see all of the videos from the previous uh, presentations. So you, uh, you have no excuse for not being totally up to date on water in Thurston County. Um, so is there anything else that I need to add? Am I missing anything? Okay, I want to turn this over to Paula, who's our director of traffic here. I mean, sorry, to Carol. And then there's Paula right there. There you are. Okay. All right, just logistics. <laughs> the sign-in tables, one at each door. So please do sign in if you haven't yet. Um, where's the water? Well, where are the bathrooms, I always say. So around the corner, you will find them. And uh, please put your phones either on vibrate or turn them off. And if you need to take a call, please do go outside. We'll, we promise to let you back in. Um, and on the backs of your agenda, it's all filled up, but what I'd like to do is just put out some plain paper so if you're called upon to give us feedback about, um, about the Where's the Water forums or some ideas for, um, for other ways that you'd like to be involved, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and we also appreciate your help to put away the chairs. And, uh, Many hands make lighter work for the rest of us. Thank you. And that's why this water study has been not only such a great opportunity to bring the community in, but to also learn how we work as a team to make education accessible to anyone who can walk into the door or roll into the door. Thank you. Um, and then we've also put out a, a receptacle at each of the doors so that you could throw away your, your paper cups. We have water back here. We also have some tangerines and some cookies. And without further ado, I'm turning it over to Paula. I'm not going to repeat everything that, that's already been said, but I have a lot of accolades for the people that have helped with this on. Um, and I would like to start with the heart of the forum committee. And please stand and stay standing, Karen Frazier. Betty Babbitt. Jill 
and the central nervous system with whom we could not get along without, Ralph Cumberland. <laughs> The muscle is the League of Women Voters of Thurston County, and our strength and support is the Thurston County residents. And this has been our first big priority, is to give you accurate information as to what the water system is in Thurston County. And my mantra, as everybody who's talking with the League has heard so many times, it's always been together, we can make a difference. And that's what we are trying to do. Um, so, Long, thank you for joining us. I'd also like to <coughs> ask you to join as a member or come to our fall fundraising luncheon beneath the forums. Um, are funded by our membership dues and the luncheon. So, please help support us so we can keep doing some more. And together we can make the best decisions for our community. And live Kono, which is in Hawaiian, do things, do the right thing. And from the tribes I learned, let's plan seven generations in the future. Here, here. Yes. Well, good evening. I'm Karen Fraser, the uh, moderator and MC for the evening. I'd just like to say, you just heard from Paula Holroyd, and she is the overall chair of the Water Committee, the empresario of all this. So let's give Paula a hand. <laughs> and I'd just like to add my thanks to all members of the Water Committee and the backbone and the spine and the nervous system and everybody. It's been a big, huge uh, effort, I think a very successful effort put these forums on and people have said they learned a lot and that's good. We're trying to promote more awareness and more and thoughtful public policy making. So we thank all of you for being here. Uh, and so uh, our, our plan this evening is we have uh, four people to speak and we'll take a break um, after the first two and then uh, we've asked each of them to speak about 20 minutes. No, or less, you can always do less. <laughs> and uh, then we'll do a Q&A after the four panelists have spoken. So, uh, let's see, I might make a few introductory comments since that haven't already been made. The theme of the uh, series has been, where's the water? And then we've had different topics under that. And that theme is taken from the Olympia Brewery's famous slogan, It's the Water, which seems to imply, at least some of us, that uh, there's an unlimited supply of wonderful quality water all around the area. So a big question we have in conducting the league's uh, updated study and putting on these forums is, is this the case in contemporary times? So we've heard a lot about this. Uh, some introductory information about water, I've mentioned this up really summarized tonight, but in the world, there's no new water. The amount of water in the world is the same that has been since the world was formed. And about 96.5% of the water in the world is salt water, most of it in the oceans, of course. So that means only about 2.5% is fresh water. And of that, about half of that is, is not available to people. Uh, because it's in ice or snow, or it's so deep in the ground you can't access it, or it's in remote locations. So really, something over 1% of the world's water is fresh water that's actually available for human beings to use for all our needs. So therefore, we argue a lot about it. Uh, you know, how much for domestic use? How much for industrial? How much for agriculture, industry, uh, energy, um, fish and wildlife? and more and more. So uh, they're, it's sometimes a, the debates are so strenuous, they're called the water wars. <laughs> so, and, or as uh, Mark Twain uh, famously said, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. <laughs> because globally it's so shortage and we have to use it for everything. We, we had a lot of really excellent speakers providing a lot of excellent information and a couple of them provided growth projections for living here in Thurston County. And we're expecting by 2040 about 125,000 additional people. That's a lot of people. And keep in mind, 
we're going to be having the same, approximately the same amount of water. So this is going to call for a lot of careful thought about our water policies around here. In Thurston County, the uses of water, the biggest use is public water systems, and the second biggest use is irrigation, I think mostly for agriculture. The third biggest use is for fish. In the southwest part of the county, there are a lot of uh, kind of fish farms down there. And then a small amount for exempt wells. We have many water short areas in Thurston County. <clears throat> and we saw a, a, a slide of the James River. Parts of it seem to be have plentiful water, and parts of it are, are uh, not plentiful. They're water short. And since uh, about 1988 or so, uh, there have been so many wells drilled in Thurston County and so many water rights issued by the state that the, the entire county is now closed to new water rights. So if you want to get water, you've got to figure out something sophisticated. But it's been since about 1988 that that's been the case. So we are a water short county. It's a little hard to uh, sometimes realize, but it, it is true. So this has had a couple of implications. Uh, one, when you drill wells, uh, it interferes, right, uh, to some extent, or certainly alters the natural flow of the water through the ground. You know, it comes from the rain, not not right here. From the rain, goes into the ground. Sometimes we have too much, goes over the ground. Uh, and then into the streams, so the rivers, and then into the sound, and some of it down the rivers into the ocean. So, uh, so it has an impact on our natural resources. And it also has created a huge demand for what are called permit exempt wells which are wells you can drill mostly for domestic purposes with a limited quantity you can take without going through all the paperwork of, of uh, the Department of Ecology to get a water rights permit. So those are all over the county. So um, we're now engaged in a lot of water planning in the county. The county is composed mostly of four major watersheds and they're called water resource inventory areas either called Wyras or Riots, whichever pronunciation you prefer. So those are um, their planning processes going on. Squally, the Shoots, Chehalis are the biggest ones. Uh, we learned a number of interesting things, including uh, that I-5 across the Squally Delta is acting as a bit of a dam, both for water coming downstream and water coming in from the south. And so the mixing to create brackish water for the small fish is being interrupted and uh, there's a proposal that I find across the delta be put up on stilts so the water can flow and mix better there. So that was very interesting. Along with other very interesting things we learned. So I encourage you to, to go to the web and find the, the, um, the videos. So we are going to have <coughs> water short or water short future or water strain future. And we're going to have to do, we learned a lot about the need to do a better job on stormwater, including uh, the runoff from I-5 and 101 to the shoots and Capital Lake. We're going to have to do a lot more on water conservation and reuse. So those are some of the things we've learned in our prior four forums. So tonight, we're going to move on to kind of, uh, our concluding session. Where's the water with regard to streams, salmon, and orchids. So I'm pleased to uh, move ahead now with our invited guests this evening. Uh, first, we have Anne Marie Pierce. She is the director of the Thurston County Stream Team. She's a water resource specialist with lots of experience, including salmon recovery, stormwater pollution prevention, stream habitat restoration, uh, she has a master's in environmental studies from the Evergreen State College. We're pleased to have you here. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Karen. Thank you, the League of Women Voters, for asking me here to speak tonight on behalf of Thurston County on the health of our local streams. So Thurston County is such a beautiful place to live. We're surrounded by magnificent mountain views, fertile forest lands, open prairies, lush green forests, 
and of course many streams and lakes and our own saltwater connection to the ocean, Puget Sound. With so much water around us, it's easy to take it for granted sometimes. And with so much opportunity to have so much fun outside, outdoors, it's no wonder that Thurston County has been one of the fastest growing counties in Washington State since 1960. Um, Karen already mentioned that we're projected to gain over 100,000 people uh, by 2040. And these 100,000 people are gonna need places to live and water to drink. And pretty much ever since the settlers first came, we've been building places to live and making a living here. And so we've been changing the landscape. And in doing that, we've also changed the way rain moves through our landscape. So in a typical forest, when it rains about an inch of rain, in a one acre plot, at, when it rains, only about 750 gallons of water would end up running off over the ground in a one acre forest. That's because most of the water from that rain event would either evaporate back up into the air or soak down into the ground. In a typical one acre lot in a neighborhood, you've got about 2,700 gallons of water from a rain event that will run off and as it does run off hard surfaces where it can't soak in, it can pick up pollution along the way. And then in a typical one acre parking lot in a one inch rain event, 27,000 gallons of rain that would run off the parking lot surface. And that's a lot of water running off that surface. Mature trees and forests, we've heard uh, from Kevin Hansen from Thurston County in the first water session, they act like a sponge and they help soak water into the ground. Um, and as the water soaks into the ground, and a lot of the pollutants can be filtered out. Um, and why do we want water to soak in the ground besides not causing flooding? It's because groundwater is an important source of drinking water for a lot of us, many of us in Thurston County. It's also an important source of water to fill our streams during the hot, dry summers. Um, unlike popular belief, most of our streams, including the Deschutes River, as we heard, is not glacier fed, it's rain fed. Um, whether it's from actual rain events or the water from rain events that soaks into the ground that gets cooled and clean to help provide water for our streams, especially in the hot, dry summers. So with all these hard surfaces that we have, that we've built, and water can't soak in, unfortunately, it can pick up pollution along the way. You know, so fertilizers and things from our <laughs> landscaping practices, you mentioned this already, Karen, and farming practices, even our cute, adorable Fidos. <laughs> and uh, cars and the list of potential pollutant sources goes on. Um, and as I showed you in that previous slide, when you've got things like parking lots with literally thousands of gallons of water running off in a rain event, um, and it doesn't have anywhere to go, in many cases it ends up flooding our streams, carrying the pollution with it, and, and can actually erode stream banks and harm the salmon eggs that are buried in the bottom of the streams. So it's important for us all to check in with our doctors regularly, right, to see how healthy we are. It's also important for us to be checking in on the health of our streams, and I'm so glad that the league that you're taking a look at this issue. Sometimes when streams and lakes are unhealthy, it's, yeah, is it better if I move out of the way with the, am I in the way of your, am I okay, should I move out of the way? Sure. I feel like I'm blocking your view. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, sometimes it's visual. It's you can visibly see when um, streams are unhealthy. I come from Ohio. Cuyahoga River is a major river in Ohio, um, and it's been documented that the Cuyahoga River has caught fire 13 times. At least fires major enough to document. Um, the Cuyahoga River also had a lot of industry located along the river. It was a great transport river too because it flows into Lake Erie and the Great Lakes. Um, so in this case, it's really easy to see wow, that stream's unhealthy. But sometimes on the surface, it looks healthy, but it's not. So I mentioned that I lived in Ohio near the Cuyahoga River and the Cuyahoga River empties into Lake Erie. Um, my family and I, we used to love to go swimming there and fishing. And as a little girl, 
I didn't really have the patience, like a true fisherman, to throw my line way out in the middle of the lake and wait for some fish I can't see to bite on my line. So I dropped my line in along the edge of the lake, and there was big rocks where the fish would hide. And um, unfortunately for my dad, sometimes instead of catching bluegill, I'd catch a catfish. And I didn't want to get hurt taking the catfish off, so I'd ask my dad to take it off. Um, no matter how big the catfish was, though, we would never keep it because catfish were bottom feeders, and a lot of the pollution that came down the Cuyahoga River settled on the bottom of the lake, and so the catfish were too polluted for us to eat. Streams, rivers, they're really, they're like our internal blood circulation. They're really vital for us. Every rain event, it's pushing rain water through our landscape systems. I mentioned before, trees and soil are really important for soaking that water in and for helping to filter any kind of pollutants that rainwater might be carrying with it out. And hopefully then we've got water from our rain events, cooler and cleaner traveling underwater, flowing into our streams, and our streams are carrying vital oxygen and nutrients um, to fish and animals and for us. We can tell a lot, if I go to the doctors and they take a blood sample, they can tell a lot about my health. Um, we can do the same by monitoring our streams and lakes and groundwater. Um, Thurston County staff across many departments have been gathering monitoring data, looking at the vital signs of our streams and lakes and groundwater for over 30 years. And our staff are also trying to collect data that's been collected by other agencies as well. So we have a very rich um, source of data and information to look at. Um, and then from there, we're looking at if this data is showing us any trends of concern related to the health of our streams. So I'm going to talk about six alarming trends that we're seeing um, with this long-term data. The first, um, you've probably seen this in the news a little bit, we have high levels of, of nutrients like phosphates and nitrates that can cause things like toxic algae blooms, um, like we've seen recently in Summit Lake. When we have toxic algae blooms, it makes the water unsafe for our pets, it makes it unsafe for us to drink, swim in. So that's definitely something to be concerned about. We're also seeing a change in our weather patterns. We're seeing warmer winters, and the rain is actually warmer that's falling from the sky. We're seeing hotter, drier summers, and we're even seeing hotter, drier springs. This is a prediction for our area that we're gonna have a hotter, drier spring this year. This can be bad news for salmon, because um, we're also seeing lower levels of water in our streams. Um, after hot, dry summers, um, especially, the salmon need to have enough water to swim upstream, like this poor little chum here in McLean Creek. They also need enough cool, clean water in which to lay the eggs and for the eggs to develop in the streams. Um, we're also seeing hotter stream temperatures. And unfortunately, like you and I, salmon can't go turn on the air conditioner. I'm gonna step back here if I can. So this is a map of Thurston County at the top is uh, you know the inlets from Puget Sound. This, is, this red line here is like the Nisqually River here. So, it's a lot of points in here, but what I want to point out is just look at the number of yellow arrows, orange arrows, and red arrows. The orange and red, so there's 29 streams on this map right now, and the orange and red arrows indicate streams that already have temperature spikes above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is 16 degrees Celsius. If it rises above that 16 degrees, if it goes to 17 degrees Celsius, that can be harmful to salmon. So we've already got 11 streams that are real close, um, and the yellow, orange, and red arrows are indicating that a trend, the data is showing a trend that these streams are increasing in temperatures, the red ones by about 0.5 degrees Celsius every 10 years. So if this trend continues in 20 years, more than two-thirds of our streams will be dangerously close to that threshold of hot, high temperatures for salmon. Our streams are also showing low levels of dissolved oxygen. And unfortunately, we can't hook them up to an oxygen machine. 
Here's a graph and it shows 15 different uh, streams in Thurston County that provide core um, summer habitat for salmon. And salmon need oxygen just like you and I. It's measured in the water. It's called dissolved oxygen. So anything below this blue line here shows data points where the oxygen levels are too low for salmon in the summertime. So more than half of these 15 streams have levels at certain times of the year too low for salmon. And the sixth trend is we're seeing high levels of fecal coliform bacteria in many streams and lakes around Puget Sound. But there's a good story, there's a positive story here. Um, many of you may have heard of an area called Henderson Inlet Watershed. Um, parts of unincorporated Thurston County, Olympia, and Lacey, parts of that landscape drains into the Henderson Inlet, which is an important source for uh, shellfish harvesting. And back in the 80s, we were really concerned about the high levels of fecal coliform bacteria we were seeing in shellfish, which actually ended up enclosing hundreds of acres of shellfish to harvesting. So over the course of 30 plus years, identifying the, uh, what turned out to be the usual suspects, our lovely dogs and um, human waste and livestock as key sources of the fecal coliform pollution, many parties got together and started helping residents learn ways that they could reduce the sources of pollution and um, jurisdictions did improvements to systems that help f uh, stormwater flow through to help filter out more pollution from stormwater systems and helped plant trees and do some restoration along streams. And so 30 plus years later, we're seeing that trend actually going downward. Fecal coliform levels are getting better and shellfish areas are opened or conditionally open to harvesting. And that's even with an increasing population in the Henderson Inlet. So given these trends that I've just shared with you about the health of our streams, what would a doctor order if you were dehydrated or you were full of toxic pollutants or you're, you were too hot? Well, you know, for us, it's say drink more water, have a healthier lifestyle, don't put so much toxic pollutants in your bodies or go find shade. But how can we help our streams drink more water? Well, we learned um, in the previous sessions about how important trees are, and I mentioned it before, to help soak water into the ground. Just think about winter time when we're getting most of our rain events, and um, if we could get that water to soak into the ground, then rather than run off quickly into streams, it would protect habitat, and then there would be more water in the ground for us to drink and to refill our streams in the summertime. We can also des design special gardens that can mimic forests that have the right kinds of soils and plants that will help water soak into the ground and help filter out pollutants. Um, some of you may know of these as rain gardens. We can also install things like special grass ditches or swales, which are specially designed to mimic forests. So they're called bioinfiltration swales, but basically it's just a specially designed swale with special soils to infiltrate water into the ground and help filter out pollutants. Or we can even just plant more trees or native uh, plants and shrubs and less lawn. If you wanted to do something at home, or you could install a rain garden yourself at home. And someone asked this question in the last session about uh, facilities in your neighborhoods. It's like stormwater ponds. You, know, you can get involved in your neighborhood and help maintain stormwater ponds and other features that are in your neighborhoods to help clean out stormwater before it enters into our streams. So there's many things that we can do on a personal individual level, you know, planting trees, taking our cars, to a car wash rather than wash them at home so polluted run the polluted wash water doesn't run into the, the storm drains into the streams and of course picking up pet waste after our dogs I finally got my husband to start doing that <laughs> and Henderson Inlet as I mentioned before is a great example that shows the collective actions of many people can make a difference um, and we like I said we're seeing an improvement and the fecal coliform levels there. But it's not just enough to try to clean up the water. We also have to make the streams 
accessible to salmon. And Thurston County has begun a innovative program to replace blockages for salmon trying to swim upstream. Um, last year was the first year where they um, replaced, I think, I'm sorry if it was four or five stream blockages. This one is an example out in the Steamboat Island area. And you can see how high up this culvert is, obviously too high for most salmon to jump. And it was replaced with this bridge. And um, that very fall, they saw salmon swim up this stream for the first time in 100 years. Wow. So, yes. <laughs> In the first year of the removals of fish passage barriers, they opened the Thurston County was able to open up seven miles of habitat for salmon, and they've got more on the list for this year. So this is not a quote from Einstein, <laughs> although sometimes people attribute it to him. It's a it's a play off of a quote from Einstein, but I think it's really applicable right now. Is that you know we can't the kinds of problems that we're facing with the, the health of our streams we're going to need to use new ways of thinking, really. Um, not the same kind of old ways that got us into the problems in the first place. The Clean Water Act that passed in 1972 was an example of changing the way we were thinking. I mentioned the Cuyahoga River that caught fire. Well, in the late 50s and early 60s, about five rivers in the United States caught fire, and that really caught people's attention, and they realized, whoa, we got to do something about it. And for the first time, parts of the, the, with the Clean Water Act, they were really looking at, well, what are the effects of the downstream effects from our industries that are located along the Cuyahoga River? Maybe that really is having an impact on the Cuyahoga River. Closer to home, we heard um, David Trout speak from the Nisqually tribe. Um, they're looking at different ways of doing, of doing forestry that will be both profitable, but also protect streams and ensure healthy streams for salmon. They're also looking at buying up key parcels of forest land and streamside land to help keep our rivers and streams healthy enough for us and for salmon. So I've talked about these trends of warmer, drier, hotter summers, warmer winters, lower levels of oxygen in our streams, lower stream levels, you know, um, certain types of nutrients like phos phosphorus and nitrates and um, fecal coliform bacteria are the trends that we're concerned about. Um, but I think that there's things that we can do to help keep Thurston County a place that's beautiful for us all to live. The orcas and the salmon, they're like the canary in the coal mine that's telling us, okay, so maybe our streams and lakes and near shore aren't very healthy. But we've seen an example with the Henderson Inlet that even with increasing population, there's things that we can do when a lot of people come together with collective actions and we have sustained efforts. We've seen that we can do this even though our population's increasing. I mentioned there's little actions that we can do and when we add them all up, it has a positive impact. And for you, the League of Women Voters, it's an opportunity to think about what, what can be done, what we can do, and where we want to go in the future. I'm going to grab a card here because I'm going to steal a quote from Commissioner Edwards. Um, Commissioner Edwards spoke at the groundbreaking ceremony for the Fish Passage Projects. This is my youngest son, Judah, at our recent field trip to Boston Harbor Marina last week. Um, but uh, Gary Edwards said, this is who we're doing this for. This is what our future is all about. This youngster might only represent about 30% of our population, but he's 100% of our future. So I want to thank Thank you all, and I just want to let you know that all of us here at Thurston County, we have very many knowledgeable people who are staying up on the latest science and research and gathering the data, and we are here to help. We're here to answer your questions, so please do get in contact with us.
Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Gabe Mattel. Is that right? uh, Matel. 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 He is a fish biologist with the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. He works in the South Sound area. He does research on and manages steelhead and salmon populations in Thurston, Mason, and Kitsap counties. He has a BS in fishery science from the University of Idaho and a master's in fishery science from Central Michigan University. So we appreciate you being here. Welcome. I'm an area fish biologist for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so my area covers, which I'll show you here in a sec, uh, South Puget Sound. I cover from Hammersley Inlet all the way down uh, around the Nisqually to shoots up to essentially where the Puyallup River comes in. So we're kind of focused here in South Sound specifically and also collaborate quite a bit with uh, folks up north and northern Sound. So some of the things I do as an area fish biologist include uh, management of our different hatchery facilities here. You guys have probably been to Tumwater Falls. You've seen Chinook there that we release. Uh, we do some cutthroat research here in South Sound. Again, I mentioned the um, hatchery Chinook facilities that we manage specifically for recreation that many of you may have fished for in the past, um, as well as cutthroat research. And then we also do Steelhead surveys on the Squally and associated tributaries, as well as anywhere we can find steelhead in the South Sound. And then I do coho surveys, as well as we do all management of warm water fisheries as well here. So any lakes that you've recreated on in uh, Thurston County, we manage those as well. So it's kind of a mixed bag of um, duties or responsibilities that we cover, but we probably focus, you know, more primarily on our salmonids here in South Sound. So specifically salmon and steelhead. Those are kind of where a lot of the management dollars go and for good reason as they're pretty economically important as well as pretty valued by you know, citizens here in Thurston County. So I bet all of you guys have seen this at least some point in school or not, but I'm gonna just go over it real quickly because I know that there's probably a you know variety of um, essentially knowledge in the room. And so, for just the basic Pacific salmon life cycle, if you guys have been down to where the 4th Avenue Bridge crosses, uh, you know, where Capital Lake comes into Puget Sound there, you've probably seen adult Chinook returning, right? So that's the adults that we all, that are highly valued by not only anglers, but also just citizens as part of our, you know, wild food webs. So that kind of starts the whole, the whole um, life cycle. So those, those fish are semiparous, or they spawn once and then die after spawning, usually right around where the females have dug their reds, the males are competing to fertilize the eggs laid by females. Those eggs then hatch and become uh, alevins, which then, you know, they, once they button up their egg sac, they become fry, and that's the freshwater stage of salmon. So those fry then spend, you know, a certain amount of time in freshwater, depends on the species, right, which I'll kind of get into. And then um, after that stage, they smolt out, undergo a number of physiological changes as they emigrate to salt water. Then they spend a certain amount of time in the ocean, and depending on the species, there's a different migratory route for a lot of them, which we can talk about a little bit more as well. But, and then after that large number of you know, years relative to the freshwater phase for most of them, they migrate back to that exact natal stream sometimes even homing to the exact red or riffle that they were spawned in. So the you know, homing piece of, of Pacific salmon is pretty impressive. So I'm going to focus uh, more specifically on both Chinook and Coho salmon as I was kind of directed to gear this towards um, you know, the, the salmon species that are really important to orcas or southern resident killer whales. And so, based on the diet studies that have been done in summer months, which um, are really kind of the key diet studies, at least, that have been done up to this point for orcas, uh, both Chinook salmon and coho salmon are, are really the key salmon species for, you know, the forage base for orcas, and especially so in Puget Sound in the summer months. 
Um, and so I'll go over kind of the status of, of both Chinook salmon and coho salmon in Thurston County. But I'm going to focus specifically on Puget Sound watershed. So I'm not going to focus on the Chehalis trips. Uh, I don't actually cover the Chehalis trip. It's kind of split, uh, split arbitrarily between um, biologists. That's just kind of how it's set up, not uh, how I set it up. Um, but I'll focus specifically on Puget Sound. If you have questions about some of the Chehalis trips, I can do my best to answer those. But I'm just going to kind of focus in on Puget Sound. So specifically, the watersheds in Thurston County really support, at this point, uh, ocean type or fall Chinook. So in the Nisqually, we did historically have a spring run um, Chinook as well, but they're no longer, uh, well, they've, they've been extirpated, and I can get into that a little bit as we go down the road. But so these fall run Chinook are what are called ocean type, which means that their juveniles emigrate out fairly quickly after emerging from the gravel versus stream type or what would be classified as spring Chinook. They spend up to a year in freshwater. Typically fall Chinook are in um, freshwater for maybe up to three months before, you know, as they slowly uh, emigrate down from where they emerge from the gravel. <coughs> So again, as I mentioned, they enter saltwater as sub-yearlings, so they're often three to four months year old, years, or uh, three to four months old at that point. And then they migrate through Puget Sound, so they're fairly dependent on estuaries, especially in those early um, periods when they enter saltwater. Intact estuaries are pretty key. So in areas where we have intact estuaries, we usually see you know, an uptick in survival, especially in the marine environment. And as many of you guys have probably been out and seen, the Nisqually River estuary is one that actually has been restored and is pretty highly functioning compared to other estuaries in Puget Sound and is one thing that we really have going for us in Chinook management here in Thurston County. So once they've entered salt water, they spend a certain amount of time in estuaries before then emigrating through the sound and out into the actual Pacific Ocean. Now most of our fall Chinook are going to end up somewhere around the coast of BC. Uh, there, are, there are stocks in uh, Washington that could end up all the way off the coast of Alaska. Those are typically coming out of some of the coastal systems or the Columbia River. Most of Puget Sound stocks will end up you know, off the coast of BC uh, relative. And um, Chinook salmon or king salmon, if you guys I've heard that common uh, name before, are the largest salmon. So they, you know, average, it's a, a pretty wide range here, 10 to 40 pounds, but historically in Washington, we had Chinook salmon that were over 100 pounds. You know, we don't typically see that anymore. Size has really dropped uh, from historic levels, but just keep that in mind, is that's, you know, the biomass that they could have reached. And so moving on to coho, or silvers, as you may have heard them called, um, they're a little different than Chinook. So they're much more tied to freshwater in their early stages. They spend typically around 15 months in freshwater before emigrating to the salt. Um, and so that means that they're really much more dependent on intact freshwater habitat than fall Chinook are. Um, as you can imagine, if you only spend three months in a stream versus 15, you probably don't have to rely on the freshwater habitat near as much as coho do. But coho and steelhead, for that matter, and some of the other um, Pacific salmonids really do rely on that freshwater habitat when they first emerge and to rear them. And once coho emerge into salt water, they then uh, spend some time in the sound but emigrate through and then remain in the ocean for approximately 18 months before returning um, to their natal stream. Again, similar to Chinook, they're returning to the exact natal tributary in the most part. Of course, there's some associated strain, but um, you know that's typically a very low rate. Uh, one thing to mention about coho is that they're on a fixed three-year cycle. So Chinook are really diverse in that they can spend anywhere from two to up to actually eight years, I think is the, one of the longer recorded uh, ocean residencies for Chinook. Coho are pretty fixed in a three-year life cycle, so they spend approximately half their life in fresh water and then the second half in the ocean before returning to spawn. 
What that means, though, is that coho are a little bit more vulnerable to stochastic events or environmental events that uh, affect a certain year class because they're on fixed year cycles. If you have a year that gets kind of wiped out, that means that three years down the road, their progeny are going to be kind of missing, right? And that gap becomes hard to fill in. And we'll kind of see that with one of the populations in Thurston County down the road. Uh, coho are smaller than um, Chinook. They're the third largest Pacific salmon behind Cham, well, Chinook, and then Cham, and then Coho. And again, this is a, a fairly wide range, but the average is around 5 to 20 from Puget Sound. And again, historically, they, they, they reached much larger sizes than that. Okay, so just to go over some of the where we're at with Chinook salmon in Thurston County and really kind of in Puget Sound in general. And many of you guys have probably seen information about this, but in the 1990s, by the 1990s, there were widespread declines of the Chinook population in South Puget Sound. And you know, this is due to a number of different things, uh, high harvest rates, habitat degradation, hydropower development in certain rivers, like in Esqually, for instance. Um, as well as you know, just the loss of suitable habitat for both rearing and spawning. And due to that, um, they're, they were listed under the Endangered Species Act you know, on June 28th in 2005. So that was a Puget Sound wide listing. So essentially when they do their listings, they use um, what they call ecologically significant units and Puget Sound was uh, designated as one of those overall units. There's also coastal units in the Columbia as well. But um, Puget Sound is its own ESU and was listed under the ES ESA in 2005. And so the two main uh, watersheds that I'm going to talk about are the Nisqually River and the Deschutes River. Those would have, or well, the Nisqually historically would have been the largest ship producing river in Thurston County, hands down. They're more adapted to large river systems. They don't use as many of the small independent tributaries like Coho do. So when you think of like McLean Creek or Kennedy Creek or some of these other systems that you've seen in Thurston County, those are more Coho streams um, than Chinook streams, really. And so the Nisqually would have been kind of the major producer for uh, Thurston County. The Deschutes is now wrapped into that. Um, it didn't historically have an Adamus access. As you've seen the falls, I'm sure, at Tumwater, they did built a ladder in the 1950s there to allow passage around that. And so historically, there wouldn't have been an Adam salmon at least above the falls. They may have migrated in the lower reaches, but... So, um, just to get into some of the Nisqually River trends that we've seen. Um, unfortunately, this, is, this gets a little grim, and so hopefully uh, this isn't too depressing, but... Native Nisqually River fall and spring Chinook, Chinook stocks were extirpated in the Nisqually River approximately around 50 years ago. And so following that extirpation, and again this is due to uh, some of the factors that I listed earlier, uh, overharvest, hatchery um, practices where they you know, use hatchery stocks as kind of a fix to these declining native stocks, that didn't work. Um, Hydropower development on the Squally. There's a couple hydropower facilities up near Alder or Eatonville, um, two in fact, that block all fish passage. Um, and then, you know, again, habitat degradation is, is one of the key pieces, especially in Puget Sound. So currently, there's a Squally River Fall Chinook recovery plan being implemented. That's through Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as the Squally Tribe, and overseen by NOAA or the National Marine Fishery Service. Um, and we're currently in the middle of what's been done is they've taken uh, an out of the basin stock, the Green River stock, and reintroduced that to the, into the Nisqually in hopes that they'll recolonize some of the reaches and start to be able to build the local adaptations needed to kind of sustain the population in some of these habitats. Um, and we're right now kind of at that colonization stage where we have some um, wild fish that are returning each year, but it's in low numbers. And so I'll show you kind of the hatchery piece of it uh, first, so you can kind of get an idea of the hatchery component versus like what our wild component is. So if you look at this graph on the x-axis, or right here on the bottom, it's just years. So it's from 1995 through 2018. 
So this is the number of adult Chinook that are returning each year to hatchery facilities in the Nisqually River. So it ranges from in 1995, there were about 12,000 adults, to if you look at big years, uh, such as like 2007 here, we had, or even 2010, so right here, we have almost 40,000 adults Chinook coming back to the Nisqually. But again, that's driven by hatchery production, right? So they're releasing millions of smolts, from the hatchery facilities, and then we're depending on those for these returns. And those are primarily what fuel our recreational fisheries in Puget Sound, as well as further up north along the coast or in the straits. Um, and so they are really important economically and for recreational purposes, but they're not the native wild stock that would have been in the Squatter River. And so if I then show you uh, trends for the Squatter River wild Chinook, it's a much different picture, right? Um, almost an order of magnitude different here. So the highest years we were seeing here in 2008 where we're still under 3,000 adults versus if you remember what I just showed you, you know, a big year for hatchery returns with 40,000 adults. So, you know, much, much less return for wild Chinook here in the Squally as well as, you know, most systems in Puget Sound. And, you know, recently, from 2008 on, we've seen kind of a up and down um, trends, essentially. And salmon populations are cyclical, so it depends on the marine environment, how favorable it is when those smolts go out the door. You know, certain years are much better for marine survival and, uh, than others. So we expect to see some up and down. But the more alarming trend is just the overall numbers. This is, these are low numbers for a big system like the Squally. And the Squaw River should be producing a lot more Chinook than this. And so, if I move on to the Deschutes River, um, again, I would like, would like to just step back and remind you that there was no historic anatomist passage above the falls. So, until they built the ladder in 1954, it, all passage would have been blocked right at Tumwater Falls. Um, which better, better or worse, uh, you know, stopped an adverse passage. If you look at the shoots upriver, there's actually a lot of really good habitat. It's you know one drainage over from the Squally comes off right here as well. Um, but because of that, there just were not historically Chinook there. So now the only Chinook that are coming out of the shoots are going to be hatchery origin. So there's a facility there at Tumwater Falls that releases you know millions of smolts each year. And again, to help fuel both the recreational fisheries and some of the economic pieces of that for local communities throughout the Sound. But there are also prey for orcas. And similar to uh, the Squally River hatchery fish, these are fish that go through Puget Sound just like wild fish do and provide an important food source for orcas. And if you guys have been paying attention to kind of what's been happening with that as that process has moved down the road, one of the things they're proposing is operating it you know, upping hatchery of production in Puget Sound to kind of improve the uh, prey source or food availability for orcas. So it does, it does uh, play a role in the food web in that sense. Okay, so if I just show you guys the, this is similar to the Nisqually River Chinook escapement. Um, again, on the x-axis is year, and then on the y-axis is the number of adults that are returning to the shoots each year. And so this system is kind of interesting in that if you look at 1995, we had some big returns there, you know, just under 25,000. Then it dropped and um, through kind of the late 90s, early 2000s, is under 10,000 until, you know, 2004, 2006, and then kind of drops again and was in pretty low year or pretty low numbers for quite a few years there. And then recently we've actually seen um, a pretty good uptick. So if you look at 2016, uh, you know, we had just under 15,000. 2017, we actually had almost 30,000 fish back to the shoots. And so as to we're looking at marine conditions, it seemed like the marine uh, environment, especially in the Pacific Ocean, was not favorable to salmon. If some of you remember, there was a warm blob off the coast of Washington that was really supposed to reduce the number of returning adults. And we saw that in coastal systems, but we didn't see it in Puget Sound, and specifically in South Puget Sound. We actually saw uh, the reverse of that, where we had big numbers of adult Chinook 
coming back to both the Nisqually, the Chutes, and other South Sound facilities. So as you can imagine, we were really wondering what was going on. And we're still trying to figure that out. It does seem like actually forage fish populations in Puget Sound have improved in recent years and may have been a more favorable environment. So that may have provided a little buffer between uh, you know, our 4R Puget Sound, especially South Sound populations compared to some of the coastal stocks. And you know, for us that's encouraging. We want to see this high uh, marine survival. That's really what drives some of these salmon populations. Um, and so hopefully that will continue in the next couple of years. Um, and actually the marine environment is turning around a little bit. The blob dissipated somewhat and it seems to be turning in a more favorable direction. Hopefully that lasts. Um, but, you know, it's, we, we will see, I guess. Okay, um, so I'm just going to switch to coho salmon in Thurston County now. And so, I, again, I, I know I mentioned this at the beginning, but coho and uh, chinook have a very different life history strategy. So chinook have a much more variable life history. So there's not only spring and fall chinook, but they vary in the number of years they spend in the ocean. And um, chinook just have a much more complex life history than coho do. Coho are fixed on a three-year cycle for the most part. There is some uh, males that will return early, but that's pretty much the only real variation that we see in coho populations in Thurston County. So for coho, they use much smaller systems. So any of the systems that you guys see chum salmon in each year, like McLean Creek, Perry Creek, Kennedy Creek, um, they use any of those small systems, uh, do very well in systems like that historically. And they also use the uh, larger systems like the Nisqually as well, but typically what they'll do is there is some main stem spawning, so they will spawn in the Nisqually itself, but they'll find small tributaries of those large rivers and run way up. And so, you know, when Anne Marie was talking about culverts and barriers, they also have a huge impact on uh, species like coho, because they want to migrate far up into the headwaters of some of these systems, and when you have uh, perched culvert like Anne Marie showed, you're blocking uh, big segments of habitat that is no longer available for not only spawning but then the rearing of their juveniles. So that's, you know, replacing culverts in a county like Thurston County or any of our counties in, in Puget Sound certainly has, you know, pretty important benefits to some of these uh, salmonids. Okay, so Coho and Thurston County, well, in Puget Sound were designated a species of concern in 1997 by the National Marine Fisheries Service. So essentially, they were, um, there was a petition to list coho similar to Chinook because of uh, widespread concern about the decline and abundance and productivity of coho stocks. When the National Marine Fisheries Service, you know, did a, essentially when they addressed that petition, they didn't find enough uh, information or data to warrant a specific listing like Chinook God is threatened under the ESA, but they were listed, or not listed, but designated as a species of concern in Puget Sound. And again, that's similar to Chinook where we saw, you know, pretty wide declines in both abundance and productivity of these stocks in Puget Sound, not only in um, South Sound, but kind of Puget Sound wide. So. Unfortunately, South Puget Sound got hit particularly hard, mostly because if you think about from a harvest standpoint, uh, they have to go all the way through Puget Sound to get back to their natal streams, which means they have to face that much more angling pressure. The habitat uh, degradation, hatchery production piece, that's kind of similar no matter where you are in the sound, right? That's kind of happened Puget Sound wide, and probably South Puget Sound is maybe a little bit more intact than some of the northern areas depending on where you're looking. Um, again, hatchery production, what was viewed as a fix for a long time in the salmon management world, wasn't really a fix. Uh, it didn't really result in, in larger returns of adult salmon, whether it's coho or shina. Uh, they're just not locally adapted to some of these streams, and mixing out of basin stocks didn't result in what managers at that time thought would you know, result in these larger returns. And again, the science has really improved, right? So I'm sitting up here. If I was in the 50s and thinking half your production was a good thing, and maybe, you know, I wouldn't have had the resources available to me that I do now. 
to understand it to a, you know, a better extent. But uh, as I mentioned again, South Puget Sound really had some of the largest declines. In certain, certain areas, we, we saw declines of up to 85% of coho runs, so 85% of you know, kind of the historical return, like that was the overall decline. Um, and again, they, were, they would have used almost any independent trib in South Sound. So you could have looked at any small system, as I mentioned, like Kennedy, McLean. These are pretty small systems if you look at you know, bigger rivers in Puget Sound, like the Nisqually River or other big rivers. Um, but they flourish in, in systems like that. And so if I just back up to uh, the Nisqually wild coho population, kind of the escapement estimates, from 2005 on, you'll see that it's really cyclical. So we have certain years where we actually get a decent number relative to other areas in Puget Sound, such as you know 2012, we almost had 12,000 wild coho return. So these populations are much more intact than um, the Chinook populations in the Squally River. This was never completely extirpated. So the wild piece hung on and has now responded to Things that have improved in the Squally, like uh, restoring an estuary, habitat improvement projects, um, and then specifically, you know, there's been some really good partners on the Squally River, the Squally River Land Trust, as well as the Squally Tribe, have been pretty instrumental in buying up large pieces of riparian corridor. And if you've had the chance to float the Squally River, it's actually really intact for. Uh, River in Puget Sound. The riparian area is pretty intact. There was not a lot of development, especially for the upper piece of the watershed. And now with the estuary being restored, I really think that wild coho have a chance and a, a pretty good fighting chance in the Squally. And certainly some of these bigger years um, would correspond to how harvest plays out too. Like for instance, if we look at 2016, which is a pretty good year in recent years, about 10,000 wild coho back to the Nisqually. That was a year where we limited a lot of outside fisheries and we didn't allow a lot of wild coho retention. Well, it turns out when you do that, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but the fish respond. Um, and, you know, they, they really do, coho are aggressive. If, if you, anyone's fished for them before, they, they will chase, you know, lures, streamers, things like that. They're, they're an easier salmon to catch than Chinook. So when you limit harvest for a species like this, it, it can really make a difference. And especially if there's habitat for them to you know, return to and actually use, like in the Nisqually. And I'm also just going to show the Deschutes River. Um, so this is a little interesting in that the Deschutes River coho um, population is one that, again, didn't have an adverse access historically. Now can get around the falls and they pass wild coho up there. It's actually one of our long-term data sets for Puget Sound that's used to look at marine survival for coho. So they're able to trap the adults as they come back and then there's also a small trap that traps the juveniles down below the falls. You guys have made, maybe have seen that. It looks like a giant cone that just spins and it catches all emigrating fish or coho that come out from the upper watershed down. And so they get an idea of how the marine survival looks for the Chutes River coho. And then that helps serve as a proxy for other systems in Puget Sound where we don't have an adult trapping facility. We're kind of lucky there at the Chutes in that you can capture the, every adult that comes up river and that, that way you get an absolute number there. In most systems, that's just not feasible in Western Washington. And they're really flashy, rain-driven, and trying to keep a trap in is kind of a nightmare. Um, but just to look at this, the Chutes River has, has been kind of an uh, anomaly compared to the Nisqually, I would say, in that certainly in the 80s, we saw bigger numbers than the Nisqually as well. But then you just see the certain brood years just completely drop off the map where we had just years where there were just abysmal returns, probably due to high, <coughs> high harvest practices. And then we had some certain years that had really big flood events. So we probably had a lot of scour in the shoots in those years. And as you can see, when you have a fixed life cycle, it really progresses down the road quickly, right? So if you have certain brood years that you lose, then three years down the road, there's, there's no real adults to come back because there's no progeny. And it really becomes, you know, extirpated quickly 
in that situation. So that's where Coho, you know, don't have maybe as much of a buffer to some of these environmental events. Uh, so unlike Chinook, where you have multiple year classes coming back in a certain year, Coho really depend on that that age class from three years ago when they return. So if you have a really bad event, you can really see it in the population structure. Um, and so that's kind of what's happened in the shoots. There's been a little bit of effort from the Squaxin Island tribe and the Department of Fish and Wildlife to try and boost some of these years and get you know more fish returning in certain years. So they've collected adult brood stock at the, the shoots facility, so in basin stock, and then raised some and released them in those small brood classes to try and boost those numbers. And it's worked to a certain extent. We'll see as it goes down the road. We like it to just kind of work itself out where we have just more naturally produced adults coming back, but you know, once you kind of get yourself in this hole, it's hard to dig out of. So. Okay, so I just want to talk about some other Thurston County uh, Salamonids before uh, I finish. Yes, I can. Um, just because uh, you know, it's not just Toho and um, Chinook centric. If you guys have been down to McLean Creek or Kennedy Creek or Perry Creek or any of these other small independent trips in the fall, a bright spot in uh, salmon management is how chum salmon is working. And uh, pink salmon are, are in that boat as well. We're actually seeing increasing trends in many years for these species. Um, and then some of the other ones I managed to are coastal cutthroat and steelhead. And some of my favorite uh, work is with those species. But I just wanted to kind of, you know, step back for a second and just acknowledge that it's not just Chinook and Coho. I, I know that those are the most economically kind of important and rec recreationally important stocks, but I mean, these are also native species that we really care about, do a lot of research on. And so to show you something a little less depressing than the Chinook and Coho status, uh, this is um, the stock status for South Puget Sound Chum. So this is kind of an aggregate of all South Puget Sound populations. And one thing you'll see is that it's a very large increase in trend. So kind of the opposite of where Chinook and Coho have gone. And if you go down to some of these trips like McLean Creek that Anne Marie and some of her folks work on and we do as well, this is often what you see is uh, chum salmon all over the spawn. This is what you would have historically thought salmon populations would have looked like in Thurston County and should have, and that would have included Coho and Chinook in places as well. But it is, you know, a bright spot where this management strategy for chum is working, where we're making sure we meet escapement goals before harvest, you know, really takes place. We're doing whatever we can to meet conservation objectives while still allowing for harvest of chum, and it's, you know, it's working, which is great to see. So. And that's it. So thank you, Gabe. Madel. Madel. Yeah. Yeah, from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. That was a highly informative presentation. I know I learned a lot about the different kinds of salmon, which I was always a little confused about. Probably there are others out here too. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so why don't we take about a six minute break. Please take a look at some of the displays that people have worked hard on and we'll come back. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, it's my pleasure now to introduce Kirsten Harma. She's uh, with the Department of Natural Resources, but has a key role in the uh, Chehalis Basin Partnership. She is the lead entity coordinator. And for those of you who are not aware, the Chehalis River Basin is the second largest river basin in the state. So this is a huge responsibility. And uh, we're so glad you're here with us this evening. She spent uh, time uh, working to protect aquatic ecosystems, meeting human needs for water. She led a water stewardship group in the Columbia River headwaters in Canada. She has a master's degree in resource management from the University of British Columbia. And she's also done fish conservation work in Costa Rica and has also worked in Oregon. So she brings a wealth of experience, and thank you for being here tonight. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the very wonderful introduction. Sorry, this computer is so huge. This is my work issue computer, so we're stuck with it. All right, well, I'm very excited to be here and to be your first presenter to speak entirely about the wonderful Muddy Muddy Chehalis River. So thank you for uh, inviting me to your forum tonight. By the end, you'll know where the Chehalis is and you'll be involved. <laughs> All right, so again, my name's Kristen. I'm on my presentation is going to talk about salmon habitat, specifically in the Chehalis Basin, how it is threatened, and how you can help. But first, a little bit about who I am. I love rivers, and I'm lucky to be working with a lot of people that love rivers too, and are working to protect and restore them. Specifically, the Chehalis Lead Entity is a community group that creates healthy salmon habitat through identifying and implementing voluntary on-the-ground restoration and protection projects. This is a very brief non-scientific snapshot of the fish in the Chehalis after our last presentation. Um, similar biology, we have coho, we have chum, we have spring and fall chinook, we have winter steelhead, uh, and we have cutthroat or anadromous fish. Unlike other rivers in the Puget Sound in the interior of Washington, there are no federally listed salmonid species in the Chehalis. So things are, things are not so good up north, but we still have a chance. This is a great place for fish to thrive, and with our help, they can do even better. So here's a little map of the Chehalis River. You can also see a map over here if you want to uh, look at that later. Uh, the Chehalis River really is a Thurston County waterway. A large part of Thurston County is in the Chehalis Basin, and a significant proportion of the basin is in Thurston County, so the red dot is roughly you guys. So a little bit about your specific rivers. The Black River of the Chehalis Basin has the highest diversity of amphibian species in the entire state. We talk a lot about salmon, um, but we've got a lot of uh, native amphibians as well. Part of this is due to the Black River wetlands. The Skookumchuck is one of the few rivers in the basin that is home to spring Chinook. So it's not threatening, it's threatened or endangered, but it is in decline. So you have an important Chinook stream here. The main stem Chehalis is home to all five species of salmon. They all migrate through here on their way to the headwaters. So I knew there was going to be children present tonight. So we're going to we'll have a bit of a story. And all good stories have a princess and a dragon. <laughs> So I'm, so I'm here to get you excited about working in the Chehalis, and the, the princesses are salmon, and the dragon is what I'm going to tell you about soon, these are threats. So as the per first presenter um, really did a good job talking about all the types of, of habitat degradation, uh, the Thurston, um, sorry, the Chehalis is largely a, an urban or a rural watershed, so a lot of the issues around uh, urban issues we don't have, but we do have a lot of threats uh, to our salmon habitat. So historically, you know, we didn't inherit the best thing from our ancestors. There were splash dams all throughout this basin, blocked the river, ran logs down them, dredged everything. It was pretty, pretty ugly in this shameless basin for a long time. So we're uh, making up for the sins of our ancestors right now. We also have uh, sins in the, in the present generation. Here's a clear cut. 65% of the Shales Basin is in managed forest. Look at the second largest watershed in the state, huge. 65% managed forest. So you also had a really excellent uh, graphic of how forests help with water. Um, I read a paper at Oregon State recently that um, proves, um, based on experimental forests, that uh, tree farms aren't like old growth forests. Um, you get higher 
peak flows and you get lower summer flows. So this is exactly the problems that we're trying to um, address at the downstream and they all start in the headwaters and these manage for us. Culverts. So we've put a lot of money and a lot of time into identifying uh, these fish passage barriers in the basin. Yesterday, hot off the press, there's 2,052 passage barriers to fish in the Chehalis. 2,000. And, you know, Thurston County's doing great with six a year. We're, we're doing something similar to that with other programs. How are you possibly going to get these, these 2,000 barriers corrected? Um, they're basically mini dams all over our watershed, um, keeping salmon out of the water streams. We still have agriculture in the lower basin, um, impacting water quality. There are some urban areas with stormwater problems. And we also have experienced wetland loss. Some recent uh, comparison of current land use conditions to pre-settlement times show that 90% of our floodplain wetlands have been lost. So, so there you are, you know, we, we seem like a pretty intact, we don't have a metropolis of Seattle sitting on top of our watershed, um, but it, it is significantly degraded from the, the conditions that Sam had adapted to. So here's a big new dragon, Ooh, scary dragon. So this, this nice graphic, it'll be hard to read, but it's there for illustrative purposes only. This is unpublished data um, coming out of the Chehalis. We've got a lot of a lot of projected loss in our salmon stocks due to climate change. Um, so these models show that by 2080, you know, get my next statistic. By 2080, we'll lose 30% of our coho and 70% of our Chinook salmon. Uh, total numbers for the Chinook right now are in that 2000 level. So I saw that was similar to one of the other um, Puget Sound watersheds uh, Dave just mentioned. Um, so we've got about that many uh, spring Chinook and we're going to lose them by the end of the century if we don't do anything. So that's a, that's a big dragon and some serious fire coming, coming down to our watershed. And here's something <laughs> that probably a lot of you don't know about. Um, there's going to be a proposed dam at the headwaters of the Chehalis. So the headwaters is up near PL, um, south of the town of Chehalis. This is the proposed plan. Um, so the Chehalis River Basin Flood Control Zone District is the proponent. Um, they're calling this a flood retention facility and a temporary reservoir. So the facility would store flood water during major flood events and release them over a period of time. Proponents are promoting this as the first fish-friendly dam. Uh, a large amount of public scrutiny is needed to determine if their claims are correct. Most people tell me there's never been a, a fish-friendly dam. Here's the website um, about that project, and I encourage you guys to visit that to, to learn more. So those are the threats. Those are our dragons. Just a quick, quick overview. Now here's your tools for being a superstar and superhero and making things better. <coughs> so first of all, there are a lot of groups working to restore, protect, and enhance habitat in the Chehalis Basin. Uh, roughly, this is a little, a little diagram. Municipal partners agencies, tribes that work in the basin. Um, roughly the upper left is, is groups that work either in Thurston County or in the, the Headwaters area, Middle Basin or down in Grace Harbor. Um, so a lot of groups, um, low staff, low capacity, but they're doing their best to, to restore the, the basin. So what do we mean when we're talking about restoration? So here's a super simple example, which is these culverts that we find 2000 of in our basin. So that's what they look like. People built roads, they didn't think about fish, they just thought about getting water out of the way. After a project is complete, this is a little bit more what it looks like. So something important to observe from this, this doesn't look like your native stream that, you know, pre-settlement times, beautiful big salmon um, stream. But what it does is it restores the processes that fish need. So the process in this case is water flowing naturally, wood getting down the stream, sediment getting down the stream. So this is what we have to do in our modern times. We can't totally restore everything to pre-settlement, but we can restore process. Here's a couple of restoration examples of things that have already been done in the Chehalis. This is Delazine Creek down in the lower watershed. Um, this was highlighted as a successful project because of the partnerships involved. There's a Boy Scout troop and a private timber company came together to get this um, fish passage project done and to put the river back in a historic channel that had been blocked by a mill pond. This is our, our poster child, literally and figuratively for the Chehalis Basin. 
uh, Jared Figler Barnes is, is now a student at um, I think St. Martin's University, but he started this project when he was in middle school. So there we go, we have middle school students. Hey, they're still here. <laughs> so he wanted to get Coho back in the stream running by his house, and he worked with the Shale Space and Fisheries Task Force um, to design a couple bridges and actually um, restore Coho. So the actual success is that um, the project was completed in 2012, and by the winter of 2014, 11 adult coho returned home for the first time in nearly two decades. So this is, this is your example of one individual making a difference. So here's overall um, what we've accomplished in the Shalos Basin in the past 20 years, since Passions for the Salmon Recovery Act. Um, 84 completed projects. You'll see more than that in terms of points on this map. So this is a statewide database. I couldn't pull out just the completed projects. The light purple is proposed projects, so things that people would like to see potentially happen. So here's a little diagram. This is what this has actually done for fish. So from our projects, we've opened up 210 miles of fish habitat. Uh, a great diagram of what that actually means. 210 miles takes you from the town of Rochester, right in the heart of our basin, up to Vancouver. So the little fishy can, can now wander all through so mostly coho streams, getting up to the, to the headwaters there. We've also done a lot of riparian plantings, about 81 acres planted, um, providing shade, filtering surface water, improving water quality. I always try to get this as great for the stream teams, get the kids out there, this is easy. You can't put a kid making a culvert passage project, but uh, you can get them doing stream plantings. Uh, protection has been a huge element of the restoration of the Chehalis. Uh, 2,500 acres have been protected. Uh, most of this is in the lower watershed. Um, in the uh, surge plain area, this is a gorgeous and unknown part of our basin, mixing of the tidal waters and salt and freshwater. A great juvenile nursery. I think somebody mentioned how important it is for Chinook. Um, there's been studies of, of this being a true nursery for fish in our basin. So by protecting land and keeping some activities off of it, it allows the functions of um, fish to continue. <coughs> Other efforts are also underway across the state to get rid of barrier to fish passage and a variety of ownerships. The lead entity coordinates with these other efforts to ensure synergy and multiple benefits. So this is what the, the fish passage on um, private timberlands has done. The green dots are ones that have been successfully um, corrected. But as you can imagine, such a big basin, much more is needed. Um, we need to do projects that address many of the degraded factors that fish need. So more plantings, 81 acres, doesn't, doesn't add up to much when you think of 2,000 I think it's similar. It's 2,500 miles of, of stream in the basin, um, nearly that many barriers to fish passage, but, but that's a good number to remember. So we got 2,500 um, miles of stream. Let's plant all those. Let's also get wood back in streams. So that's kind of what those splash dams did in the old days was make, uh, make wood out of streams. We need to get it back in there. Also reduce channel incisions. So this is an issue you wouldn't think about, but as there's no, there's no vegetation on the banks, the channel gets deeper and deeper and deeper, and then it can't access its floodplain anymore. And that really reduces the quality of the stream. So a lot of people living along banks of the Chehalis will say, oh, i got erosion problems. Well, you've got you know, channel incision problems as well. So it's a real problem for fish. Um, and additionally, we need to uh, improve the stream flow. So water quantity is an issue in our basin. So I'll switch hats briefly and, and talk about what I do in my spare time, which is manage the Chehalis Basin Partnership. Um, they were the original watershed planning unit for the basin. Um, some of you guys involved in the, the early 2000s might remember this. I'm sure you're very well aware of the watershed planning efforts. Um, so this has reared its head again in a good way. There's been recognition that fish need water, and water is habitat. Um, so a lot of our activities on the landscape have, have taken water for human needs um, to the expense of uh, in-stream flow needs. So this is a new Stream Flow Restoration Act. I think you guys had a whole program on, on the Hearst fix. Uh, Shalis is one of the 13 or 15 basins in the state that this affects. So what it means is the Shalis Basin Partnership is now revived and active. The original planning unit members are now at the table once again to take this on. Um, we've got funding, which is great. Um, so we can hire people and I have to do this off the side of my desk. Um, we need to create a plan by 2020 to replace the exempt well use, consumptive use for water in the Chehalis. Um, we hope to do much more than that. It, uh, let's make this, let's make this a, 
a, a floor, not a ceiling. So let's do as much as we possibly can. Um, Exempt Well is not the only user of water in the basin. And this is an opportunity for funding to, to really come to projects to, to make a difference here. So a lot of people are really excited about, about this effort. There's also a new level of, es of efforts that some of you may or may not have heard of. Um, the Aquatic Species Restoration Plan um, is proposing an entirely new level of effort um, through coordinated effort and significantly increase the funding coming into the basin. Uh, it recognizes that significant action is needed to combat the losses expected by the end of the century. So again, taking a hard look at what climate change could do. Um, I think one of the students said that the temperature was the real beast in the, in the um, water quality world, and indeed it is. Um, our fish are, are cold water species and warming temperatures aren't very good for them. So a lot of plantings, a lot of floodplain reconnection needed to our basin to, to reverse those declines. So $10 million has been invested of state funds in the last four years, um, mostly to barrier correction projects to kind of get, get a jump on doing some of this restoration work. And if you look at what else is coming through the state to restoration, I think our entire salmon recovery budget is, is about $30 million from, from surfboard. We've got $30 million in the next two years to put on the ground. So this is, this is really unprecedented for the Chehalis. We have been off the map um, for the past 10 years, again, because of a, a lack of federally listed species. Um, but this ASRP slash Chehalis strategy is putting the Chehalis on the map um, as a need to ramp up what we're doing. So much more is needed. Um, despite some successes, which I've outlined, uh, number of miles we've opened, uh, plantings, etc., uh, we really need to do, get more voluntary and collaborative efforts on the ground uh, to protect conditions that fish need in order to ensure they will keep coming. So you can help. I promise I twist everybody's arm here to, to, be, a, to be a superhero for the Chehalis. Um, lots of ways to get involved. Uh, I'll talk to you on the next slide about voluntary efforts that you can get involved with. Um, if you happen to own land in the, the Chehalis, I already met here somebody tonight that lives near Elma. Um, if you have stream habitat on your land, let me know. Let's do a project. And um, there's also volunteer opportunities. So here is um, a couple of examples. So we have a project review committee. So this is a committee that goes out on the ground every year. Um, and looks at um, salmon habitat projects to evaluate them both from a scientific and a local um, value perspective. Uh, they're going out next week to look at our next round of surfboard projects, so I can't involve you guys quite yet. But think about the next year. We'll, we'll need more volunteers. Um, really excellent opportunity, and you get fed sandwiches, I must say. <laughs> our habitat work group is the kind of overarching group for the lead entity. Um, it's about 20 members right now, but there's no limit to membership. We get rolling interest over time. Anybody that kind of just wants to know, like Paul has been to our meetings, like, hey, what's going on here in the Chehalis? You can just pop in. Um, it's, a, it's a clearinghouse for, for folks that are doing some sort of restoration or protection. Community outreach about salmon resources. So this is getting folks out to community events like this. Like, we have very few events in the, in the Chehalis that have nice boards like this that tell about the great work that's happening. Um, we need more people to, to staff that and volunteer. Big, huge area, uh, very few events where we actually directly engage with the, the common general public. We have a watershed festival every year. I'll make sure you guys are out on this in September. Uh, we have two stream teams. Like you guys are talking about the stream team uh, here in Thurston County and also the students have been involved with. Grace Harbor has a stream team. There's also one in China Creek, which runs through Chehalis. The Shales Basin Partnership is in need of um, people to be on the projects committee. So we have a really short timeline to get the Stream Flow Restoration Act stuff done. We need people to help develop these mitigation projects that are going to successfully restore water. I know there's no real water, but that's the, that's the proposal, restore water. There's lots of local groups. Um, I mentioned on that first slide with the Squiggly and the Chehalis. Um, find one that matches your interest. There's, there's really something for everybody. We've got Land Trust, Fisheries Task Force, um, bunch of other, other groups there. And lots of getting involved, question the dam. Um, they, need, they need to be questioned. They, they seem to think in Lewis County that they're moving forward with this. Um, really get people to, to ask them some hard questions. Is this a fish friendly dam or is it not? So here's pictures of real people. I've got them in the back table over there in my Watershed Hero series. Uh, we had local photographer Paul Dunn uh, do a series of photos and interviews. 
um, one of the featured people is here in this room, Jan Strong, is a featured watershed hero. Um, so there's a lot of people, these are, these are real stories of folks um, doing projects either on their land or, or with their community or a couple of students at the community college. Um, really whatever your skill set, interests, background, there's, there's a role. Um, I call these the, the faces of the watershed heroes already doing great work in the Chehalis. But together, we can report, repair ecosystems and restore healthy salmon runs in the Chicago. So, thank you very much for your time. I'm now pleased to introduce our fourth speaker of the evening, who gets the award for coming the furthest. She came all the way from San Juan Island. <laughs> So we want to welcome Cindy Hansen. <clears throat> She's the education coordinator for the ORCID Network. And her background, she has a bachelor's in zoology from the University of Washington. She's worked as a whale watch naturalist and an education curator at the Whale Museum in Friday Harbor. I hope a number of you have been there. Uh, she's the education and events coordinator for the ORCA Network. She has spent time in Mexico uh, uh, with the migrating gray whales. I was like, you, well, you migrated down there. You see their migration. <laughs> yeah. And she's been a naturalist and guide for Baja Discovery down there. She's a licensed veterinary technician, a volunteer, and board member for Wolf Hollow Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. And she volunteers for the cat rescue group. So we're delighted to welcome you to Thursday Cat Rescue. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, I am a little sleep deprived because I do have some newborn orphan foster kittens that I've been feeding in the middle of the night for the last three nights. So if I start rambling, let me know. Um, but thanks for sticking it out till the end. I want to talk about how all of the things that you've already heard kind of connect to our local southern resident orcas and what's going on with them. So most people have heard of our resident killer whales or resident orcas, the southern residents. Uh, they've been all over the news, particularly in the last year, and they are fish eaters, primarily salmon. Salmon makes up about 95 to 97 percent of their diet. 80 percent of that is Chinook salmon, uh, with coho also being important, and then chum also plays a pretty important role in the winter as well. What a lot of people don't realize is that there is another group of orcas in the Pacific Northwest called transients or bigs. They are very different from residents. They are considered the same species, but they are genetically distinct, have been for probably hundreds of thousands of years, and they eat primarily or exclusively marine mammals, so primarily seals, porpoises, the occasional whale. So the transient orcas are actually thriving. While residents are critically endangered, transients are doing very well. They're healthy, they're reproducing, there are new babies being born all the time, they're fat and happy. So here in these waters, we have these two groups of animals, same species, their paths cross, but one is critically endangered and one is thriving. So what are the threats to southern residents? Why are they not doing as well as the transients? Historically, they were shot at pretty regularly. Uh, people were afraid of them, thought that they were dangerous to humans, thought that they were competition for salmon. So it was pretty common to just set up rifles on the edges of the islands and just shoot at them. It happened on a regular basis. In the 60s and 70s was the capture era. So we think about one third of our orca population was removed in just about 12 years. And it was mostly young whales. They were easy to transport, easier to train. Uh, they went into aquariums all over the world. All of the orcas who went into captivity during those years have died except for one. Uh, you may have heard of her. Her name is Tokitai or Lolita at Orca Network. We are trying to bring her back home uh, to a big sea pen or retirement home in the, in the native waters. In the wild, they can live as long as people. Their average lifespan is pretty much the same as people. In captivity, that lifespan is 10 to 12 years. So the shootings and the captures are no longer taking place, fortunately. They are both illegal, have been since the 1970s. So once these became illegal, the population started to climb. Uh, scientists estimate that 
Historically, the population was probably somewhere between 140 to 200. After the captures, there were 70 or 71 left. Started to climb once those became illegal, but then, unfortunately, started to decline again. So in the 1990s, there was a 20% drop in the population from 99 individuals down to 78. That's what led to them being listed as endangered in both the United States and Canada. And interestingly, the year that they were listed as endangered in the United States is the same year that those Chinook were listed in Puget Sound. So currently, the population is at 75, so half of the historical numbers, and really has not improved since they were listed as endangered. In fact, it has continued to decline since then. So the population is the lowest it's been in 30 years. Current threats, what's happening now? Uh, vessel disturbance is a big concern. Orcas use sound or echolocation to find their food. If there's too much noise, it will interfere with that. So their feeding areas are in the middle of the international shipping lanes. So you have oil tankers, cruise ships, cargo ships, ferries, private boats, you name it. They're all out there uh, making noise. Another big issue is toxins and contaminants, and orcas are at the top of the food chain, and these contaminants biomagnify, so they build up in the food chain. So it starts out as a molecule of a toxin in a little plankton. It's going to make its way up the food chain and become potentially thousands of molecules in the orca. So these toxins are suppressing the immune and reproductive systems. The biggest issue is lack of prey, and again, Chinook salmon is their primary food, and as you've heard a lot, that has declined uh, in some river systems more than others, but it's a huge issue. This graph uh, just kind of shows you the correlation between Chinook salmon and southern resident orca mortality. So on the bottom, this is Chinook salmon abundance, and on the top, this is southern resident orca mortality. So you can see when the abundance of Chinook salmon is high, mortality is low. When Chinook salmon abundance is low, mortality is high. There's a direct correlation. And where does Thurston County play into this? You heard a lot about the Chehalis River. We love the Chehalis. The Chehalis is really important. As you heard, the Puget Sound stocks of Chinook salmon in particular are very low. The Chehalis River still has hope for recovery and still producing a lot of salmon. As the Puget Sound Chinook has declined, our orcas are relying more on the outer coast stocks. And the Chehalis River is actually identified as a priority stock for southern residents. So it's a very, very important river system that we really need to protect. Another big issue is low genetic diversity. With a population of 75 animals, uh, genetic diversity is very low. So some scientists from NOAA recently did some DNA studies to look at paternity and who the fathers are of all the youngsters out there. And what they found is that 50% of the current population is related to these two males. 50%. This one is no longer alive. So he's like the main breeder. Uh, he's an L pod. There are some other males out there that are contributing to the population, but again, 50% related to two males. The other big issue is a very high rate of miscarriage. Scientists have determined that there is a almost 70% miscarriage rate in females, and that has been linked to lack of food. And I'm sure you all remember this from last summer. Uh, J35 gave birth to a female calf, first calf that had been born alive in about almost three years. It only survived for about a half hour, and then the mother continued to carry the body for 17 days. She would not let it go. This was seen and heard all over the world. Her message was heard everywhere. Uh, we like to say that she did more outreach and education in, 20 year, in 17 days than we've done in 20 years. So uh, people's eyes were definitely opened. So what's going on now to help them recover? There's a lot of research. Don't have time to go into all of that, uh, but the Center for Whale Research keeps the census on the orcas, who the individuals are, uh, they all have names, they all have numbers, designations, the family tree, they figured all of that out. There are drone studies looking at the health of the orcas. They can determine if they're skinny, if they're well-fed, they can determine if the females are pregnant. Um, and this study, they're actually collecting orca scat, and they have a poop-sniffing dog <laughs> that can actually 
smell the scat and they can scoop it up and they can get amazing information from that. They can look at exactly what the whales are eating, what the toxin levels are, what river system the salmon came from that they ate. Uh, they can look at stress hormones. They determine that lack of food is causing the most stress. They can determine DNA. They can determine pregnancy hormones. That's how we know about miscarriages. All of that information comes from Orca Poop. Who knew? So that's what's going on with research. There's a lot more to it as well. Uh, but I want to talk for just a few minutes about uh, the task force and the legislation that just took place uh, this year. So the Southern Resident Orca Task Force was formed last March by Governor Inslee. The task force met for about nine months and came up with 36 recommendations that they then presented to Governor Inslee on what they think needed to happen to protect the orcas. I won't go into that in great detail, but basically this is the breakdown. These is, this is the number of recommendations and what it went towards. So you can kind of see there were a lot of different uh, aspects of Southern Resident Orca recovery that were included in those recommendations. That then translated to Governor Inslee uh, releasing a $1.1 billion budget for Southern Resident Orca recovery. That did include the culvert removal that was already mandated through a lawsuit. Uh, but as we know, that will actually help restore a lot of salmon. And then year two of the task force uh, began March 18th, so they are still deliberating on year two items that need to happen. So fast forwarding to the legislative session for this year, there were four ORCA-related bills that came out of that, that came out of these recommendations. One had to do with toxics, one had to do with vessels, uh, so there is going to be a new speed zone around the orcas where you have to stay seven knots or slower within a thousand yards of the orcas, uh, also increasing the distance to 300 yards for whale watching boats. There's another one that has to do with Chinook salmon abundance, um, and that has to do with uh, shoreline armoring, and then there is one for oil transportation safety. All four of these bills have passed. So that's the great news. The other good news, which makes it actually really timely for me to, to be here tonight, is that tomorrow, Governor Inslee is signing these into law. So I will be able to attend that. So this worked out really well. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, as far as the budget goes, actually, we didn't get as much as we wanted out of the budget, but we got more than we thought we would. So I'm calling that a win. Uh, there was a lot of salmon recovery projects. Three of the 11 main projects got funded. Uh, you can just kind of look here and see there was funding for uh, habitat restoration, there was funding for hatchery increases, uh, funding for increased spill on the Columbia and Snake River Dam, so just kind of a wide variety of things. So we're, um, we're pretty happy about the way the budget fell. I just also want to briefly mention Canada is doing something very similar. They have created their own version of the task force. They have released their draft recommendations. They have taken public comment, and we'll end up seeing what happens with that. But they are actually recommending some fisheries closures, as well as a mixture of voluntary and mandatory regulations for small vessels and some work on contaminants as well. Here is how you can help. There are always things that the public can do to help. I do have a lot of these cards on the table. Please feel free to take some if you would like. Uh, basically, what we have done is, in honor of J35, who carried her calf for 17 days, we have 17 items or actions that people can take to help the orcas. So if you would like to take any of these cards, please feel free to help yourself. And I also want to just sort of end on some good news. There is a new calf, which you probably heard. This uh, little one was first seen in December and is still alive. So her pod, L pod, was actually seen down in Monterey, California, just probably about a month ago. The little calf is still there, looks really healthy. So that's great news. We also know that there are a couple of other pregnant females. So we are hopeful that we'll see a few more surviving calves out there. This little one is the first surviving calf in three years. So we're hoping for some more. And then I'll just kind of leave you with this quote from uh, kind of a hero in the orca and salmon world, Alexandra Morton up in British Columbia. She said, if we lose the southern residents, it will be the first extinction where every individual's name was known. So here's some of the few we've lost and why we're working and why we're doing what we're doing. Thank you.
thank you again, Cindy Hansen with the Orca Network and for coming all the way down. Well, we have time for maybe a couple questions before we have to start picking up chairs. So is there, are there a burning question or two? So uh, given the importance of Spring Chinook to fill in the gaps of the Orca feeding, is that hatchery effort going to focus on that? Oh, I'm sorry. So, to whom are you addressing? It would be Gabe or Kirsten. I mean, okay. sorry, Cindy. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to my knowledge, uh, Spring Chinook is a component of that. Um, oh, sorry. There's a little button there. Hello. Uh, yeah, to my knowledge, there are spring chinook populations identified in Puget Sound, as well as uh, some Columbia River stocks. Uh, I'm not really the, the expert on this. I, I know a lot of the production is going to be also fall chinook, uh, which we'll see how that fares. Uh, I think we do get a, quite a few excess hatchery fall chinook back in even South Sound facilities, meaning that those fish are still available and not being preyed upon. Um, but yeah, spring chinook does fill a gap that is certainly one of the one of the stocks of chinook that are probably the lowest abundances. So if you could boost that production specifically, hopefully it would have a positive impact. And I think they have identified certain areas that that is going to be interesting. Any other question? Turn that one over here and then over here. Yeah, this is for Gabe. Gabe, the, the, two, um, the two slides that you show with the, with the uh, Chinook hatchery, um, both, for, both for the Nisqually and both for the, for the Deschutes, showed that spike in 2000, 2017, and it was and on either side was half or less than that spike. What, what are the hypotheses of what was going on? Could you repeat the question so we can get that on the record? Yeah, sure. So the question was that in 2017, we saw pretty high abundances of uh, hatchery chinook at South Sound facilities. And then um, you referenced 2016 being almost, you know, probably just half the amount. I think uh, 2018 should have been a little bit more than that. Uh, maybe not as much on uh, the shoots. In 2017, we saw one of the biggest runs we've seen at the, some of the South Sound facilities in uh, a decade. And some of that, we're seeing really high abundances of anchovies as well as other forage fish in South Sound. So for part of the work that we do uh, related to Cutthroat, we team with the forage fish crews and do a lot of uh, Puget Sound work or we beach sand and do other uh, capture methods in the sound. And those data indicate that forage fish base, like such as uh, anchovies or herring, have really gone up in recent years. And we think that may be providing a buffer. Um, one thing that we've talked about a little bit. Uh, and this is, don't quote me on this, uh, but it's just a hypothesis, is that Puget Sound may be a better place to reside in for Chinook than it has in past years. And we may be seeing adults reaching what we would typically think of adults uh, of adult sizes in the Pacific. And maybe there's, there's some that are just staying in Puget Sound and they're a little bit buffered from uh, mortality or other uh, issues that they face from when they migrate out all the way up to like BC, for instance. Uh, that's one thing we want to try and look at with CWT recoveries or other data that would maybe lend uh, or inform us on whether or not there are certain individuals that stay in Puget Sound year round and are able to get to big sizes. You know, historically we had pretty robust blackmouth population, which is just a term used for um, Chinook that's like stayed in Puget Sound year round and got to large adult sizes. 
And if that was the case, it may, or if that is the case, it would indicate that Puget Sound has is, is been a little healthier in recent years, as at least for a forage fish based standpoint. But again, that's just a hypothesis, and until we can actually look at some of that, um, it would really be just, you know, speculation. So. Same for dams. I'm going to bring you the mic so everybody can hear the question. We hear a lot about the need to take down the Snake River dams, but evidently there's a lot of controversy about that. Share an opinion, either of you? Everybody chime in. <laughs> So the Snake River Dams, as you said, there is a lot of talk about that. It is very controversial. Uh, so one of the things the task force did recommend was a stakeholder forum that would take place trying to talk to the people in Eastern Washington, figure out what their needs are, and just have a conversation. And that's something that has not happened. Uh, there's a lot of people who have looked at the economics and the benefits and all of that, but nobody's actually really sat down and, well, not nobody, but in, in a statewide manner, people have not sat down and talked to the people in eastern Washington who rely on those dams for irrigation for their farms. They rely on those dams also for transportation of wheat across the river. So those needs have to be addressed. There are ways to address them, but the conversation needs to happen. That's one of the things that was funded in the state budget. So, um, so that will be happening. So I'm hopeful that that will move that conversation forward, that their needs will be met, and we'll be able to also provide some more salmon for these orcas. Anybody else, Anybody else want to comment? chime in? Okay, we we'll probably take another question. Oh, did you want to? I was, I was just going to say that the Columbia, we, we consider that written off. It's hot up there. Shayla's coastal watersheds, refugia for cool water. This is like <laughs> so help her some with those recovery things she was talking about. It's very important. Is, is there another question before we go to adjournment? Uh, so I think we've... Uh, We've learned so much tonight, and thank you again to our panelists for bringing excellent information and enthusiasm and inspiration. And I would like also to encourage a round of applause for the League of Women Voters Water Committee. an extraordinary group of talented, hard-working people who are fabulous organizers, work together well, and we've, we've had a, a great series here, and uh, we're looking forward to moving on from here and doing further research and coming up with whatever we're going to put in our report. So we'll see, and if any of you want to have further input, please uh, contact any of us. So and again, it's not too late to join. Yes, yes, if you would like to join the league, if you would like to join the water committee, we cordially invite you. So thank you very much, and if you could take your chair to a, a chair place, we'd appreciate it.